All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm going to get us started here. My name's Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Tonight, we are really excited to welcome Eleanor C. Whitney and Nicole J. Georges. Eleanor Whitney is a writer, editor, marketer, and community builder who hails from Maine and divides her time between Brooklyn and the Mojave Desert. She's the author of Riot Woman and her previous book, Quit Your Day Job. She's currently pursuing her MFA in creative nonfiction at CUNY Queens College. Growing up immersed in the feminist DIY values of punk, riot girl, and zine culture of the 1990s and 2000s gave Whitney, like so many other young people who gravitate toward activism and musical subculture, a sense of power, confidence, community, and social responsibility. As she grew into adulthood, she struggled to stay true to those values and with the gaps left by her punk rock education. Her new book, Riot Woman, Using Feminist Values to Destroy the Patriarchy, is an insightful, deeply personal history of early 2000s subculture, lovingly exploring the difficulty of applying radical feminist values to real-life dilemmas and embracing an evolving political and personal consciousness. Whitney traces the sometimes painful clash between her feminist values and everyday adult realities, and anyone who has worked to integrate their political ideas into their daily life will resonate with Riot Woman's histories and analysis. Throughout Whitney's book, the words and power of Bikini Kill and other Riot Girl bands ground the story and analysis, bringing it back to the raw emotions and experience that gave this movement its lasting power, while offering a complex, contemporary look at the promises and pitfalls of Riot Girl informed feminism. She joins us tonight from Joshua Tree, California. Joining Whitney in conversation this evening is Nicole Georges. Georges is a graphic memoirist, podcaster, and professor here in Portland, Oregon. She's the author of the award-winning books, Calling Dr. Laura and Fetch, How a Bad Dog Brought Me Home. She is currently the host of Sagittarian Matters and Relative Fiction, a podcast with OPB about family secrets. She's joining us right here in Portland tonight. This event will include an audience Q&A. If you, uh, you see the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you can use that to ask your questions uh, of either of them tonight. And as well, if someone has typed a question that you like and would like to know the answer to, you can click the thumbs up button and upvote that question. Uh, more importantly, please consider supporting Whitney and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy Riot Woman, along with the link to George's books, will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Eleanor and Nicole, thanks for joining us tonight. We're really excited to have you. Thank you so Thank much you for having me. <laughs> so, hi, Eleanor. Hi, Nicole. So excited to see you uh, after all this time. I think our last conversation was right before the pandemic. <laughs> oh, when we were coughing at each other's faces and sneezing into our hands as we gave a handshake. Yeah. We definitely used the podcast microphone before we just breathed all over it. So <laughs> different times. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Nicole and I thought we'd ground the discussion tonight just by sharing a little bit of our work first. So I'm going to read a six minute passage from Riot Woman. It, uh, that was a really great introduction. So that really is extensively the background you need <laughs> for the book. And because we're virtually in Portland tonight, I thought it would be great to read a part about when I first moved to Portland, Oregon in 2000 and why I went there and what started to happen and what drew me there and what the values are that I was looking for. So um, this and Powell's features in this. So I just felt like it would be a great place to start. And then after I read, Nicole is going to share a bit of her work and then we'll have a chat and then we'll take questions. So thanks so much. Um, so this uh, chapter of Riot Woman is called Girl Utopia Found and Lost. 
To teenage punk feminists like me in the year 2000, Portland, Oregon was a beacon of radical possibility. The city was the center of my visions of girl utopia, a place where I imagined girls and women's experiences could be centered and I could build a life and identity free of the influence of sexism, racism, and homophobia. I wanted to step off the plane and find my feminist identity fully formed to be transformed by my new association with the place. Just down the interstate from Olympia, Washington, one of Riot Girl's founding cities, Portland was home base to feminist bands I idolized like Slater Kinney and Team Dresch. Musicians, activists, and artists had flocked there due to the do-it-yourself, creative culture, and cheap rent. The city had a history of basement shows, independent record labels, and zine publishing, and had hosted a Riot Girl convention in 1996 that brought together girls from all over the Pacific Northwest and country for workshops, discussions, and performances that had become the stuff of legend in the zines I read in the late 1990s. Even though Riot Girl itself had faded in Portland and the city was rapidly becoming more expensive as people moved there in increasing numbers, I wanted to immerse myself in its legacy. I arrived from rural Ming, a newly minted high school graduate, unaware that in addition to the thriving punk scene, strong coffee and Indian rec book and record stores, the city also boasted a faltering economy and a history of white supremacy and sexual violence often masked as the pioneer spirit. I had one year to live there before starting college in New York City and was intensely focused on finding the version of the city I had imagined. I was determined to meet other queer feminists and jump headfirst into the community of girl punks, feminist zine publishers, and bike riding activists. I was looking to girls in Portland to show me real life examples of how to fuse my feminist identity with activism and become my guide to a more radical life. In many ways, Portland did resemble the girl utopia I dreamed about. One fall night after a bike ride, I sat on the Skidmore Bluffs with a group of girls, thrift store jackets adorned with silkscreen patches, looking over a vast industrial park next to the Willamette River and felt like the city belonged to us. It felt both cozy and challenging, a mix that lulled many of us, despite our interest in radical activism, into thinking that the prevailing values in Portland would easily extend to the rest of the country. While Portland was a somewhat politically progressive pocket surrounded by a more conservative state, I was relieved to be in a place where it seemed my very existence as a young woman was not questioned. I felt like being there would give me the opportunity to become who I wanted in a community of others who shared my values and politics. However, much like Riot Girl had been, the majority, but not entirety, of girls and women involved in the underground scene were there were white. And while many of us were inspired by the politics of activists of color, our social circles were fairly racially homogenous. Still, I wanted to figure out who I was as a feminist and what embracing the identity of a feminist activist really looked like. I hoped Portland was a place where I could ground myself in that community and create my own feminist world. I felt rigidly determined to devise an answer of how to live as a grown up radical feminist. I met Deirdre through trading zines and a punk publishing conference she helped organize. She was loved, feared, and above all known in the punk feminist zine community. She commanded attention with her wild fire engine red hair, mismatched thrift store style that include plaid skirts, fluorescent pink tights, and worn out Doc Martens. I was drawn in by her sharp writing and her wry, quick snark. She specialized in calling people out on their shit and her rant slid up internet message boards devoted to zines and punk. She was ruthless. I was scared out of my wits and in awe of her. To me, she embodied the kind of charismatic offer no apology and take no shit kind of punk feminist activist I desperately wanted to be. When she invited me to help her start a radical feminist art collective inspired by movements and groups like the Guerrilla Girls and ACT UP, I was, delated. Uh, I was elated. I felt like this was a one-way ticket to the girl utopia I dreamed about. It seemed like a way to revive the scrappy DIY feminist spirit of Riot Girl, drop some of its more problematic baggage, and adapt it for the early 2000s. 
At the feminist collective's first meeting, I sat at a scuffed table in the cavernous cafe of Powell's bookstore with a group of young women Deidre and I had recruited via our zines and handmade flyers posted at bookstores and cafe. They were high school and college students and dropouts, musicians, writers, zine makers, and artists, shy and hopefully hopeful, mostly white, but also Asian, Latinx, and Black. Many had just arrived in the city from different corners of the country, as disparate as Ohio, California, North Dakota, and Hawaii. Collectively, we were looking to forge a sense of feminist community and figure out who we were as artists and people. As we went around the table and introduced ourselves, Deidre looked each person up and down as if sizing them up for the revolution to come. And what could possibly go wrong? Eleanor, at that time, pals did not even have soy milk in their cafe. No. They proudly didn't even have soy milk in their cafe. It was like a big deal when they got soy milk at that cafe. Wow. I, I, as a, as a newly minted vegan at the time, I'm shocked, but I hate to say maybe as a punk, I was too cheap to buy the coffee and just sat in the cafe, <laughs> taking up valuable real estate from paying customers. And thank you, Powell's for not kicking us out. <laughs> that's, I think that's fair. That's a classic, classic maneuver. Um, I was just going to do like a really quick tiny reading because I re realized when I was reading your book and we were talking about what we were talking about that Fetch has like a little mouthful about when I became a teenage zinester in Kansas City. So you're going to be able to see the screen okay. It's not going to look perfect and that's okay. We're keeping it punk. Can you see that okay? Looks good to me. Thank you. Okay, great. I was a scruffy punk with a sharp tongue and no connection to the horrible things happening to my body as I morphed into a woman. God, hold on. I just want to look like a cute indie boy in a small shirt singing the song of lots of people that got big boobs against their will. Ugh, I just look slutty. I hope no one notices. I'll just wear this instead. People, you guys know what I'm talking about, but. I'm also using the parlance of the time. I was just beginning to find my release in the world. I really did know every Nirvana and whole song, which I would sing by myself in front of my, um, in front of my CD player. Only a few years out from an angry childhood and debilitating stomach ailments, I let my life be changed through zines. Before I found zines and punk music, I turned my feelings inward, harmfully. Handmade publications offered a different sort of outlet. I discovered other girls writing about hard, unspoken truths, abuse, mental breakdowns, and daily sexism. Enjoying little alien scene. Um, you can't be what you can't see. Through zines, I saw a world of punk feminists, and I felt so grateful. This is my zine that you're never going to find called Kitten Breath. Don't try it. My own note in a bottle, an opportunity for feelings to live outside of my body was a photocopied tome that I, tome that I wrote and sent across the country. Bring, bring, hello. Uh, hey, Nicole. Well, we're just calling to tell you you're whack. Ha ha, you're whack, whack, whack. You're so whack. Mm. Mm. I made new pen pals through zines, but thank goodness for my high school boyfriend at the time, because two weeks into dating him, I lost all my local friends at once. What happened? Mm, I guess I don't have any friends anymore. In my zine, I wrote about a friend who was taken advantage of by an older male in our community. I used his name. So one night, Bonnie and I were out late, uh-huh. And this guy, John, says, you can stay at my house. I won't try anything. Ha <laughs> ha. I printed his first name. And those are the boys who, and those, I wrote, I put his name and the names of the boys who stuck up for him. Those boys were my best local friends. My escape ropes out of the suburbs and into the punk scene. My release, like the entirety of my release. So I told them, my punk friends the next day, and they said, oh, he wouldn't do that. He's a nice guy. 
My attempt at connection isolated me and Bonnie just never wanted to talk about it again. I didn't have room for any more betrayed dark feelings after adolescence. I had to shut them off, transform them into something new and productive. I wanted to publish my story and find allies. I wanted to be understood. Um, and I'm gonna share a different screen now, a different sort of screen. I don't know if that means I'll just kidding. So I did, I lost all my friends at the same time. And uh, anyway, I've always drawn. I've always wanted to be an artist. First an animator, yes. Oh my God, wait, you have to draw the same thing over and over again? Oh yeah, no, never mind. Then a comic book artist. This is what it must mean to be a comic book artist, superheroes, origin stories. Oh, my cyborgs do not look like Marvels at all. Well, that's it for me. I even tried to take art classes based on my ability to recreate a turtle beatnik. A representative of the Correspondence Art School came to my house. But here's a portrait I did from Clockwork Orange. These are great. I'll be in touch. But this was not my path either. Too expensive. Momentarily deflated, I stopped drawing for a while. I scuttered into a world of zines. I favored first person narratives, punk music, and the underground. Through zines, I found diary comics and something clicked strongly into place. You didn't need superheroes or gags. A person could draw her own life. Um, I think I'll end that there. And then I moved to Portland. Thank you so much for sharing those excerpts. I love them and it's really powerful to hear you read them out loud. Oh, thanks. I thought about, I'm gonna go back and go forward, but I really thought about that um, when the Harvey Weinstein thing was going down and I was listening to the podcast um, by Ronan Farrow and all these women had spoken up about it and people were like, she's crazy, she's crazy, she's crazy, she's unemployed now. And then Ronan Farrow came out and was like, hey guys, hey men, it's me, a man. I think something happened here. And they were like, oh my God, really? Tell me more. And I just, it felt, I really like felt that moment again of being like this one canary in the coal mine being like, something's happening. And everyone being like, you're hysterical. Yeah. And I feel like, and again, we can go going forward to go back, I guess. I feel like the first time I encountered that attempt at accountability and is was in zines and what and I think it was sort of like that shitty media men list that was going around during the height of the me too movement but it was in zines like it was like shitty punk men basically and it was kind of that whisper network and I think one thing like and we were talking about this earlier today but one thing I think the zine symposium and Nicole and I are co-founders of the Portland zine symposium one thing we really had to grapple what with was how do you create a space like within punk that is safer you know nothing is ever safe safe and what does it mean to create that accountability and in that community in this underground community so that was a challenge early on but I think zines and that community were my guidance from them so it was just really interesting you know almost 20 years later to see this being grappled with in the mainstream and and fortunately so you know but just like you said all these women and folks throughout the years coming forward and then when and who finally breaks it through so people pay attention yeah I want to back up and I want to know how you came to Riot Girl and what your understanding was because you and I are a little bit younger than Riot Girl's main moment? Yeah, great question. And I feel so akin to that moment you shared in Fetch. I feel like I have a very similar story in the book about finding zines. I grew up near Portland, Maine. So it's pretty rural. It's not super, super rural. It's like 10, um, 10 minutes, no, two hours from Boston. So when I was able to drive my first big show when I was 18 was I drove down and I saw Slater Kinney and it was like, you know, life-changing moment. Um, but I think very randomly, I discovered zines through music. I ordered some records uh, from Kill Rock Stars and no, actually, that's not right. I found a poster for this band called Long Stocking, who I've tried to find their music on the internet, but I 
have not. And it was in the free bin at the record store in Portland. And I was like, this looks cool. There's girls in this band. So I sent away either to Chainsaw or Candias records, one of them for, and anyone on the chat, like correct my facts. We're going back like 25 years now is about 96, 97. And with my music came flyers for zines. And I was like, whoa, what are these? And then there was a catalog called Catch of the Day uh, that had different crafts and zines and music. So I sent, and they were from Olympia. So I was like, oh, self-published magazines. Like this makes so much sense. I've always written, but I never felt like I could find an audience. And I didn't even need to know like what they were. It just made sense. So I sent away and, you know, zines reviewed other zines at the time. So I just went down this rabbit hole. So for me, I'd always made like weird little publications. I had a newspaper about horses in eighth grade called the Equine Inquirer. Um, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> and so you want to see that again. Yeah, you're not going to find that. Your Although I'm book. sure my parents have it in a file somewhere. Um, bless their hearts. And so I think for me, it was that combination of an outlet for writing, which I'd always loved, but also had just experienced a extreme emotional abuse in my first like serious relationship. So it gave me a place to grapple with that and understand what had happened to me in a way that wasn't clinical or kind of social worky, but it was with peers. So it was a way to speak up and express my rage and also understand like what had just happened. So that's a long-winded uh, explanation. But then there was zine fairs actually in Boston and I was able to go in person and like meet uh, other young women and other young people publishing zines. And I think some of them are even here tonight, which is amazing. So these are connections that have lasted. So um, very, uh, oh, thank you. Noah in the chat says, Chainsaw, I knew someone would, uh, Yes, and thank you, Nate. Yes, okay, awesome. See, this is this is what community is. Um, so check the chat for the footnotes. So that is, but I think now that you have my long-winded story, to answer your question, I think what was really interesting about coming into Riot Girl and sort of post Riot Girl, huge air quotes around that at that moment was as I was learning about Riot Girl, I was reading critiques of Riot Girl. So zines um, by folks like Mimi Wynn, Lauren Martin, Bianca Ortiz, who were really calling out the whiteness of the movement and interrogating like, hey, are you really connecting to these politics you purport to have, or are you centering your voice and serving yourself? And as someone who grew up in a very majority white state, in a more, you know, politically, I'd say conservative, or just a, a household where we didn't really talk about power and in, in that way, I think it was really, really eye-opening to hear that kind of critique, not from a study or an academic voice, but again, from the voice of my peers. Uh, so for me, I kind of went into it, even though I idolized the movement and like wished I'd been part of it, I also went into it a little more eyes wide open. Uh, though I think this feeling of like isolation and not really being part of it, I didn't realize until I read Sarah Marcus's book, Girls to the Front, that that was a common feeling for women who were active in Riot Girl at the time. Or I remember Lauren Martin writing about in her zine, feeling kind of disconnected from Riot Girl New York City because she lived on Staten Island. You know, and these are things like I wouldn't have realized because I was like, I'm just stuck in this backwater state, but it was actually a more common experience. So I think also kind of learning about the movement through the media's eyes, maybe I thought it was like more coherent or, or different than it was. So what about for you? You know, did you have a similar experience? Yes and no. I was kind of too entrenched in like a kind of misogynist dude zone. Um, like Kansas City was so small that it was like the weirdos were just, that, that's who you had to be friends with. Like you didn't get to choose like the better weirdos from the less good weirdo, you know, like, like me even like not wanting to hang out with someone that was like a known date rapist was like controversial, like, whoa, look who's a snob. You don't want to hang out with that guy who everybody likes. And so um, for me to have any like subculture friends, I kind of just had to like eat shit sort of like I just, and they were always making fun of Riot Girl. So I found out about Riot Girl from men doing impressions of Kathleen Hanna's voice. 
being like, meh, 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 making fun of her spoken word, making fun of her music, even the other punk girls I hung out with because we wanted um, approval from the men so that we could still exist in the punk scene. And so I did it. So I like specifically was like, I'm not some man hating riot girl. Mm. And I had something called girl positive, which was a fucking riot girl. Fucking riot. I wish I was smart enough to have been a riot girl. It was called girl positive. It was in my, um, it was in my den of my house. It was all girls coming and talking about issues and talking about, you know, people talking about incest, abuse, like rape, mental health, classism, sizeism, sexism, like all the stuff that I had seen in Riot Girl zines. So like as much as I was like in punk dude land, I also was in zine land, which I got into through ska. And um, I found Riot Girl zines and uh, confessional zines that way. Um, and my mom would come down and be like, if you guys want to know about women's rights, what about unborn women? And she would like pop a VHS in of some like horrible abortion thing. And everyone would be like, oh yeah. And I was like, mom, get out of here. Get out of here, mom. Um, anyway, I got into the zines. I didn't, and then I got into queer core. I kind of skipped right from dude punk to queer core and just being like, oh, fuck you guys. And finding out punk, mm -hmm. um, and finding like, through the zines books from V Vale, finding like Fat Dyke Magazine or Out Punk or, and just being like two butch women kissing <laughs> and reading all the zines, reading STS's zines about being mm -hmm. gay and having an exorcism. And um, yeah, and then I moved to Portland, you know, and I loved Slater Kinney. I loved Team Dresh. I loved all those bands. And we just moved to Portland on a whim. My best friend was really into K Records and was like, let's move to Olympia. And I was like, we're not musicians. What are we going to do there besides follow <laughs> around bands that you like? That's going to get old fast. And so we moved to Portland instead because we just needed to get out of Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I fixated on Portland, honestly, but I think it was just that a lot of my favorite bands were there. And then I did a writing camp at Lewis and Clark College of uh, the summer before my senior year of high school. And I was so excited. We got to go to readings at Powell's and um, my friends Donna White and Elka Weber from Zines were had an art show at 17 Nautical Miles, which was this punk club at the time. And they, I got to like help them set it up. And I was like, my dreams are coming true. So, you know, so I think that drew me to Portland because there was like that possibility of doing things with other people around my age, around art and music and politics and activism. But it certainly, yeah, then that's where we met and got to work on some projects together. So yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, <laughs> now I'm asking you a question or the question I think for me that I was really thinking through a lot in this book, and I'd love to hear from you too, is like, how did Portland kind of work its way into your artistic practice or how you thought of yourself as just an artist or a person in the world. I mean, I think for me, I kind of spoke about it already, but it was that sense of possibility and finding willing uh, collaborators for projects or seeing gaps that we didn't have in our community, like a gathering for all these self-publishers that were there and making things happen, even if we had no idea what we're doing. And I am forever grateful for the IPRC for uh, that's the Independent Publishing Resource Center, which is an amazing nonprofit that continues to this day for supporting us as our fiscal sponsor for the first year of the Zine Symposium in 2001, when really, like, we did not know how to organize an event. And it's to this day, I'm like, how did we do that? <laughs> I think we had $500, you know? <laughs> so people rolling sushi in their house to feed the people for free, people staying up all night, like, creating elaborate meals, Teresa and Jillian, to feed to people for free the next day. Like punks just get to like show up off the back of a train and just eat hand rolled sushi. And we're like, no, it's fine, it's fine. We dumpstered all of it. Um, Portland, I, I mean, I got so excited to see Reading Frenzy when I stepped off the, the turnip truck from Kansas City. I just was like, zines, I'm zines, I love zines. I've been doing zines since I was 14 you know, with my first scene, Hitman in high school when I worked at Subway about ska music and aliens. Um, the thing about Portland, the way it affected things was I got to relax. Living in a small town, nothing wrong with living in a smaller town or not in a coastal city, but 
there was a lot more pressure. If there was a thing I wanted to happen, I had to be the person to make it happen. And in Portland, I felt a little more relief of like, there's already food not bombs. I don't have to be the person with the, the bag of bagels in the back of my car. Uh, you know, like I could walk away from the zine symposium after six or seven years or however long, and it still happened. Like I didn't have, you know, like in Kansas City, I was like the motor behind the different things that I wanted to see there. And then when I stopped doing them, and also this speaks to my inability to delegate or collaborate at the time <laughs> as a teenager. But as a teenager, I was like, I'm the only person that could do food, not bombs. And no one else will understand how hard it is. And so then things would go away. And here there was already structures of people who have been doing activism, social activism for years and years and years. And so I could come in, see how I like different things, you know, do what I wanted to do. But I had organized a zine conference in Kansas City. And then we came here and then I got kind of paired up. I heard that your collective was uh, curious about starting a zine festival. And I was like, oh, well, I I've just did a zine festival. And um, then I got scared away a little bit and then I came back. Yeah, well, really glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> um, but Eleanor, I wanna talk a little bit like what, I wanna talk about how you see Riot Girl now and why you're choosing to take that particular political movement into your feminist activist space in this way now. Thank you for that question. So I started the book in 2014, which feels like an entirely different cultural moment. And I think that's just a reminder too that art takes time. I am not elevating my book to high art, but just making things takes time and making things will take the time they're going to take, especially when you're balancing them with other parts of your life. Um, and things happen, elections, pandemics, personal trauma, it all happens. Um, so, I think for me, the question I really started the book was, this was a moment in 2014 when like kind of lean in was coming out and there was just this really like neoliberal feminism, like kind of white, just like you go girl, very individualistic. And it was like very cool to have feminist t-shirts. And I was just like, what is this? Like I work in tech um, and you know, there's a lot of conversations about sexism and and oppression in tech which is great that they're happening but they don't go too far and there's a there's a chapter in the book about that we could have a whole other conversation about that but I really was like okay where is the relevance of this very DIY oriented kind of raw greedy feminism now that is completely imperfect but like is this just gone? Is this just a cultural footnote? Like the media always said it was like, what is this to me? Like, can I move forward as an adult who works in marketing and tech really still believing this? So that was the question that I began the book with. And then the election in 2016 happened. And I think we did see a cultural shift. And we also saw Black Lives Matter become really prominent and the Me Too movement and suddenly questions of power and intersectionality were in the mainstream and I was like shit yes this is great still what does this mean you know now this is still a cultural footnote because it didn't go far enough you know or because it's just so it was just wanting to explore these questions and sort of think about like who was that younger person who became and is becoming this adult person and what does this mean? I think especially as we see a cultural moment of 90s nostalgia to really plumb that and say like, okay, but what was really going on for people? And it wasn't just cool fashion and things weren't just better in the 90s. You know, there was like really serious stuff that we can actually bring forward. And so if now, I think I really want to say, like, I learned about this idea of intersectionality through Riot Girl, And I, like I said, I really feel like it was uh, women of color in the Riot Girl movement or in the punk movement who helped shape my thinking and my activism. So I think what I'm hoping is that we always look really critically at subcultural or cultural movements and know that they're more than are what being portrayed by the media and also I think I was thinking about like, okay, what does it mean to have like a community approach now? You know, does that mean like we saw during the pandemic mutual aid work in your community? Does that mean hosting dinners with uh, immigrant families or, you know, hosting know your rights 
events, you know, as an ally, what does it mean to be an ally or an accomplice now? Like it was just really trying to push myself in that thinking and not like rest on punk laurels either. So I think that's where I see. So I think now I see kind of Riot Girl be picked up again as, you know, like Bikini Kills selling out tours, which is awesome. But I went and saw their show and it was super powerful, but it was also super weird because suddenly it's like, everyone's there with their husband. And I was like, yo, would you have gone to this as teenagers? Does it matter? Or were you one of those people making fun of Kathleen Hanna's voice? You know, like, what is this now? And I'm not trying to be like snobby and be like, you can't do it now. Yes, you can. But are we kind of holding up some examples or ideas of fashion or music and kind of leaving behind some of the raw gritty politics? That's the question in my mind now. And, you know, it, it happens to us all. Like, how is things being marketed? How are we marketing ourselves? <laughs> so how I mean, are we it back? Is something, when I was reading Sarah Marcus's book, I was really, I almost took my breath away here or reading an interview with Corin from Slater Kinney talking about how the media defanged the movement 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, like by the time, of course, when I was a teenager, I was able to be cynical about the Spice Girls and the marketing of girl power. But the fact that Riot Girl, you know, had been a, a very political movement by young women and the media just completely turning it into a style thing. Are completely focusing on the wrong things, isolating certain people as idols. I just, as people engage in political movements, I just, all these lessons, you know, and also you and I were talking before about how, you know, that was one thing that happened with Riot Girl. And another thing is maybe amongst the, and I mean, they can say I'm wrong, but maybe amongst the Riot Girls in Olympia or DC, there wasn't as much coalition building as there was in say something like ACT UP, which had a sustainable activist practice of like learning from, taking lessons directly from the Black Panthers and the civil rights movement and like labor organizing and lots of different like immigrant rights movements and unhoused people. Like they built coalitions and learned from people of color and like had the patience to sit with other communities and be like, what do you need? And what have you done? And what do you think we should do? And yeah. I don't know if that happened in Riot Girl, and I think that could be why it went the way it did. Yeah, and and I think too there is there's such an emphasis on personal voice and storytelling, which is so important and empowering, as both of you and I have experienced. But the flip side of that can sometimes be like, well, I spoke up, I told my story, isn't that enough? And I think what I've learned from a lot of those movements you just referenced, as well as smart people in my life who hold me accountable, is you need to make that next step and you need to connect it to systems of power and privilege and and think about where you're at in that and then think about what else has been done that you can learn from. And I think punk in general, you know, really wants to think like, oh yeah, we invented this, you know, and, it, and then the more you learn, you're like, no, we didn't at all, you know, and it's more just that power keeps existing. So we keep find like finding similar solutions to push against it. So I wanted to push myself on that too in, in writing the book and, and bring some of those voices in as, as much as I could while keeping the focus pretty specific. This brings me to one of my final questions before we open up the Q&A, but we have more things that you and I can talk about if the Q&A is, you know, if people put your Q&A questions in there, because if you don't, I just have a million, a million things I can talk to Eleanor about that are right here. But one of them is, what's your mission statement? You're somebody that has a long career arc of creativity and activism, and I want to know, like, what's behind it? What, what's your guiding light? Yeah, and I want to know the same from you after. Uh, so I actually was challenged to say that by one of my professors in um, at CUNY Queens College, Kamiko Han, and she was pushing me to kind of distill the writing I do down to like one or two words because I've written more like how-to books um, to help creative people kind of be be successful on their own terms, as well as this book and writing that explores you know, white people's role in white supremacy. That was really what I was focused on in undergrad and in a lot of my personal essays. So I think the word Kamiko said actually was empowerment. And at first I was like, huh, because I think the way like neoliberal feminism has sold us empowerment and Sheryl Sandberg has sold us empowerment is like, 
lean in, you know, you empower yourself to get your own. And I think where I'm coming from empowerment is like taking stock of where you are and what you can do and what tools you have and what tools your community has that you can use together to realize a vision that like not only helps yourself be creative, but can be like an asset to your community. So I know that sounds kind of lofty and pretentious, but I think empowerment does encompass this writing, but trying to be very critical about where the power is in empowerment. Uh, but I think in terms of how that's expressed and the specific mission of each book, you know, changes as I change, uh, which is good, or else it would be really boring. And I just write the same book over and over again. What about for you? I have this written down somewhere and it hasn't changed a lot, but for a long time, it was A, to help animals, two, to try and create uh, empathy in readers by being vulnerable in public. So readers who don't know a queer person, don't know a Syrian American person, don't know a vegan person, don't know a person like me, maybe they feel like they do, if I am able to like vulner be vulnerable and have an emotional connection with them. And so maybe then they'll think about that when they have to vote on something that has to do with me um, or people like me, or just even consider my way of thinking. Um, and then the third thing is I really want to, uh, empower other people through self-expression as a tool for people to amplify their own voices to impact social change. So sharing the tools of production. And that's been my goal. That's been my thing for a, like for 20 years, which is basically like there's, you know, it does no reason that just I need to be the person who knows how to self-publish or, you know, talk to agents or blah, 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 blah. Like I'm here to share the tools of that with as many people as I can, which is why I started the podcast. Too. It's like why I teach zine workshops, why I teach school, why I teach whatever thing. It's just trying to share the tools so people understand how to do the thing and amplify their own voices for social change, whatever that means for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel really similarly. I think through the zine symposium and learning how to organize events, I fell into a career of first education and event planning and now marketing and especially working with creative people, like I always try to share those tools because these are learned skills. They're not things that are innate to some people or other. And there can be a lot of gatekeeping around that. And I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I'm interested in really, yeah, helping people to get their message and out in the world. So. And that's, I mean, I have to say, that's a real thing I love from Riot Girl is Bikini Kill being like, it's not that hard to play music. Just stand up front, look at what we're doing, you can do it too. And that's why both of us, like I've been volunteering at the rock and roll camp for girls for like 20 years and just like working with senior citizens and all kinds of people to be like, it's not that comics is not brain science. Comics is not rocket science. You're not a neurologist. Like it's not that hard to make comics or write or make a zine or make music. Like you can to make a podcast. You can do these things. Sure. There's there's things you can do to make them better, but it's really, you can figure it out. And I'm happy to help you figure it out, um, you know, as much as I possibly can. So we have some questions. I'm gonna go to the Q&A first, and then I'm gonna go to the chat. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A section. It's easier for me to organize. Dear right. Eleanor, I love your writing, and I always wanna support it and you however I can. However, I wonder if you can speak to publishing your books with Microcosm. Its co-founder has been problematic over the years, accounts of abuse, et cetera, and I don't feel great supporting them. Thanks, from Amy Greenan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That's an amazing question, and certainly one I've grappled with myself over the years. And I think, and this is something I think we could have a whole, again, hours-long discussion on is around um, accountability and community and allowing people to be accountable and to grow and to change. And I think it's also really everyone finding their comfort level with that. So I think for me, my relationship with microcosm extends back to 2001. So knowing the folks involved in that for a really long time and really understanding their intentions in the world. So I think that's to me and really frankly, having hard conversations and being insane, like, hey, like this is happening. I'm hearing this, like, talk to me about this. 
what is going on, you know, and really, and as someone, like I said, as a survivor myself, that is incredibly important to me, but this is a personal relationship I have, you know, so like, I can't speak to the co-founders, you know, personal relationships with, you know, in their life. But I think for me, from a professional standpoint, I felt like, okay, they're doing the work, you know, I'm pushing them. I feel like they're willing to grow and change and be accountable. And that's important to me. Now, I think also microcosm has really changed a lot of the folks involved now are women and non-binary. And I think they've done a lot to actually lift up voices of, I would say people who are not included in the mainstream publishing world. And that to me is like really important. It does not erase, you know, these questions. So I think again, it's for folks to decide. So I'm not going to be like, so you should feel great. And like, you know, buy my books. I think like, thanks for showing up and supporting me. And I'm always happy to talk about that more, you know, offline or, or online, wherever. But I think just for me, it's also been about like that process of learning and accountability and allowing people to grow and change, you know, but that doesn't mean it makes it okay for everyone. I don't know if Nicole, you want to address that more generally, just because it's something we have talked about, about like accountability, <laughs> you know, in this community. Yeah. I mean, I believe in accountability and I believe in kind of, you know, growing up, deciding who's important to you, who you want to be accountable to and why and how, and even interpersonally being able to say I fucked up. Mm -hmm. And then here's what I'm going to do to make amends, which isn't just saying the words, but making amends as like an action, as saying, I'm not going to do it again. I'm acknowledging this thing happened. I'm not going to do it again. That said, I'm probably not going to publish another book with them. However, I wish them the very best. And I wish your books the very best. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for always supporting me as well you know it's well, of course and I've and I and I've been a part I've been literally part of the accountability process with that person before like and it's it's no joke like accountability processes are not easy business accountability like groups of people that come to take you to task or ask things of you as a person who um people have said has done harm is like it is no joke it was really intense. It's really fucking intense. And I believe this person has done a lot of things. Um, but. And also, I think, you know, in general, accountability processes and people who engage in them, it's an act of generosity towards that person. And let's be very clear about that. That is not labor people have to do. I mean, yes, in some ways you feel like to protect my community, I have to do it. But to put yourself on the line like that is frankly, exhausting and a big, big act and a big ask. So it's really amazing also that you stepped up and did that. So, and that, you know, and we, and I think when we think about this idea of accountability more generally, that's also like for us to say, like, do, can, you know, do I feel like I have the resources to do this or not, you know, and am I putting myself more in harm's way by engaging in this process or not? because so we could talk about that forever but I just want to say like thank you you know also I would hope that people who care about me would come to me in the same way that you have come to that person this is from an anonymous attendee history repeats itself your stories could be my friends and me in high school college and in adult professional situations I'm 67 many truths fortunately I had feminist grandmothers born in 19, 1902 and 1889 P.S. I'm that same girl, just in an older, experienced body. I love that question. That's a, that's, a, that's a comment, and I love it. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you for your comment question. Okay, what are three things someone could do in their everyday lives to realize a vision of empowerment and feminism and destroy the patriarchy? Hi, Eleanor, from Marisha Jinsky. Hi, Marisha. Three things, three simple things. <laughs> if, if this, if my book were a BuzzFeed article, it'd be like three simple things you can do to destroy the patriarchy. I think what's really hard is it's not that easy because the patriarchy, like all kinds of power is really sneaky. And when we think like, aha, I've got it and I'm addressing it, 
it kind of morphs and changes form, you know? And so I think it's just really, for me, okay. Number one, I think really checking in with yourself and saying like, where is either my motivation coming from or why am I doing this thing? Am I doing this to like, please someone else? Or am I doing this because it is something that I believe in? And then two is really saying like, who in my community is this thing going to like help or hurt? You know, what is, what is like extending beyond this? Um, and then three is just doing it now. That's very vague, you know, but I think what it is, is starting where you are. So if you, um, work in like animal rescue, if you work in PR, if, and I'm, I know Marisha's really involved in both of these, <laughs> um, you know, just looking at whatever your world is and where are there kind of problematic power dynamics manifesting themselves and who can you build coalitions and community with to start to address those. And it can be as simple as talking to other people in a room, right? Or just sharing your experiences and then building from there. So don't be afraid to start small and to just I think get people in a room or a Zoom room because Delta variant and start talking about and sharing your experiences. I, um, when the election of 2016 happened, Beth Pickens put out a pamphlet called Making Art During Fascism. And one of the things, cause it was, everyone was overwhelmed with like the number of things that were going wrong at the same time, the number of fires to put out. And she had people sit with themselves and I'll do this sometimes when I feel like I'm not doing enough. The world isn't fixed. It's like, just make a list. What do you have to give? And then what do you not have to give? What do you have to give? Is it time? Is it money? Is it space? Like, is it art? Like, what do you have to give? And then what do you not have to give? So like, you know, maybe you don't have money or you don't have, you know, one of the, one of those things, the, the list will balance out and then identify, you know, one to three organizations that directly benefit you and identify one to three organizations that benefit somebody outside of your thing. Um, and then, you know, see, okay, here's what I do have to give. And here's the thing that's important to me. That's not about me. Just, just match those up. Absolutely. And uh, my friend, uh, artist, Aurora Lady, always said, activism is finding your superpower. So it's not some, and it's exactly what Nicole just said. And, and Beth Pickens said, it's not finding something that's like so far out of yourself. And I think the fallacy of like my early twenties and teens was like, oh, I'm going to find this different person who's an activist, you know, or an activist is someone who, who doesn't, isn't me right now, instead of saying like, exactly that question. What do I have to give? What am I good at? And where can that, and what do I love to do that can benefit someone else? So if it's design or illustration or writing, you know, or cooking, like all these are important skills or organizing people or using email programs, you know, these are all things that can benefit communities. And it's just fun. And I think it can sometimes be challenging to find where to plug in, but I think it's just trying it and not, and as you said, not being afraid to start or just if you see something interesting happening, seeing how you can help uh, and, and just asking and listening, <laughs> you know, and not coming and saying like, I know what to do, but being like, what do you need? I mean, this is the thing. This is the thing that people don't like to hear, but it's the truth is you have to spend a long ass time just, you have to, I have to, you have to kind of decolonize your volunteerism which I learned like working with homeless youth, working with senior citizens was like, you expect these people to open up to you if you're just like rolling in off the street being like, here I am. Like if you wanna make a meaningful impact in a community that's not your own, you have to be there long enough to listen and to actually be able to hear what people need and, to, and how you can fit into that or not. And I think it takes time. Like at a certain point, if people wanted to work with like, old people or unhoused youth in Portland, I was like, okay, do you have six months to go every week? And people go, like, oh, I just want, but the people I worked with were like, why are these people just showing up to volunteer for like one or two weeks? And then we get attached and we never see them again. And it actually was harmful. So yeah, absolutely. Fine. If you have time. Yeah. And I think that's, again, something when, and this is something I kind of 
touch on in the book, like when I was younger and impatient and you said it too, Nicole, like, why isn't the world fixed yet? Like there was sort of, I approached activism with this very like rigid perfectionism and impatience. I'm still working on those things. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't go away just because you're 40 or whatever, but just really thinking about like, can we live more with ambiguity and not taking on that colonial kind of savior complex of like, I have the answers, but instead listening very deeply. Um, I'm aware that we're coming to the end of our hour, but um, Marisha asked about, uh, and thank you for your sweet comments and thank you everyone for taking an hour out of your evening. But Marisha asked about writers that have inspired us. So maybe I'm wondering, to close, Nicole and I may, I'll ask you first, Nicole, and then I'll go because I have to think. Um, could you let, tell us one thing, one or two writers or, or artists or musicians that are inspiring you from a kind of feminist standpoint, and then anything you're working on now or places where people could join you again to get more of your amazing insights? What do I like? I like a group online called Elder Queer. I like Linda Berry, shocker. I loved Sarah Marcus's book about Riot Girl, Girls to the Front. I thought it was so great. Um, I'm looking forward to reading Jessica Hopper's book. I love, I mean, I was very moved by March, the trilogy about John Lewis's life. I felt I was like crying and I just, I feel like I had a moment where I was like, he's the bravest person in the country. It just was, it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful trilogy. If you haven't read it, please read it. Um, and what do I like to listen to? I, I, I like Linda Berry too, because her stuff is very empowering. There's, she's like taken the gates down from gatekeeping about art and writing. Um, and lastly, I still like listening to Teen Drush. I, just, the best. I, I like, I, I like Dykes. <laughs> I'm going to say Dykes as a whole. Check them out. Check it out. And what, anything cool coming up where people could join you again? That's a great question. Okay. I'm teaching a workshop at the Fine Arts Work Center in December. You can go to my link tree on Instagram and find out. I have a calendar coming out very soon. I have a Patreon page where you can get printable anonymous fuzzballs, all kinds of stuff. Um, go there, check it out. Yeah. And Sagittarian Matters, you can listen to on iTunes and Relative Fiction, you could listen to also on iTunes. Yeah, I cannot stop telling people about Relative Fiction. So if you haven't, Ooh. yeah, if you haven't listened to it yet, please do. I was riveted, riveted, I think. And so thank you for that, um, those plugs and also, you know, where folks can join you again. And thanks for letting me stall because one book that I was talking about with some folks yesterday that I just love is uh, Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings. I've been like, looking at that book. Oh, it just the way she combines like huge issues, personal storytelling, just blazing critique is so inspiring. It's an incredibly powerful book. And I was saying to folks, I want to like diagram her essays to like see how she does it. So Kathy Park Hong, Minor Feelings. I really love uh, Briallen Hopper's Hard to Love. Um, as someone who had read this kind of wan book spinster. Uh, Bree's book really has a retort to kind of building a feminist life and building feminist community in a way that isn't, I would say, like very neoliberal capitalist feminist. So Brielle and Hopper, hard to love. And I will always love Rebecca Solnit. She, you know, when I think about the writer I most want to be like, I would say Rebecca Solnit. Um, and uh, sorry to diss other books on, uh, like Spinster, I quote it. Like it, it was a great book to read, but I, I love Bree's book. And uh, so please do check it out. And I think I will always, and I know people have, again, kind of held up 
maybe I'm an older generation of feminist at this point, but bell hooks for me will always, always, always be a touchstone for intersectional feminism. You know, it doesn't mean that I agree with her at every point, but that was someone who just blew my thinking out of the water as a teenager. And, you know, I go back to it a lot and I'm like, wow, you know, so kind of playing the hits sometimes is helpful. And going back to things that influenced us before and reading them again can be really helpful. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I guess just in terms of, for me, uh, if you're in Brooklyn, I'm doing a release party on the 10th of October outside at a bar called Mama Tried. And uh, we'll be doing a few more online events uh, the 13th of October with uh, Rachel and Jolie and El Torres uh, with Room of One's Own Books. So I have a website and a newsletter so you can sign up and find me on Instagram at Killer Femme, which has been my handle since I was 17 years old. <laughs> So um, I would love to, you know, continue any kind of conversation there as well. Uh, so thank you. And thank you to Powell's this, I told them like, this feels like a homecoming for this book. Like I could think of no better way to like bring it into the world. And I feel like I'm still at one of those little stuffed tables, you know, I guess drinking my coffee without soy milk. Apparently. <laughs> you remember well, that, Kevin? Uh, <laughs> soy, milk? soy milk. Yeah. I don't know when it was introduced to the cafe. I thought that was a very funny, a very funny point. Um, Eleanor, we're really proud to uh, host you and to uh, support your book, Riot Woman. This is it right here. Um, I'm going to put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat. And this event will be, uh, you could watch it on YouTube tomorrow afternoon if you know some other people who missed it or wanted to uh, check it out, uh, tell them about it tomorrow, and you can watch it there. Um, I'm also going to post the link to Eleanor's book right there. I imagine if you click it, it'll go to a separate window, and you can keep it there and buy it after the event's over. This is Nicole's book, too, or one of Nicole's books. Love this book. Um, so thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks again, Eleanor. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, for joining us and um, yeah, tune in for other uh, Powell's events, powells.com backslash events to see what's coming up and uh, everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye.